This is a homily for the first Sunday of Lent. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. St. Mark tells us that the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness and he remained there for 40 days and was tempted by Satan. What was the nature of those temptations? How was Jesus tempted by Satan? Mark is silent. To get some understanding of the nature of those temptations, we have to go to the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. As St. Mark tells the story, once Jesus has finished those 40 days in the wilderness, he emerges with a very simple and straightforward message, repent and believe the good news. I'd like to focus on just one of those words, the word repent. What exactly does that mean? What does it mean to repent? Well, the word repent is our English translation of the word the Greek New Testament uses, metanoia, which means literally a change of mind. A change of mind in this sense, a new way of thinking, a new way of seeing. I had seen things in one way, now I see them differently. I had thought of someone or something in one way, but something has happened and it's changed the way I think about that person or that thing. I've had a change of mind. Now, we all see life differently. To take a very simple example, imagine some people going for a walk in the forest. If those people happen to be botanists, they would be interested in plants, photographing them, categorising them, may be taking some specimens, but that's their focus of attention. If, on the other hand, they were bird watchers, the plants wouldn't really interest them, but birds and bird sounds would. If, on the other hand, they were geologists, they're not interested in birds or in plants, but in rocks and in rock formations. So on that same walk, different people can see things quite differently. There's also another way in which we look at things differently. We have the expression to look at life through rose-coloured glasses, which tends to suggest that we see things as we'd like them to be rather than as they actually are. So the illustration there has a couple who are perhaps a little overweight, but with rose-coloured glasses, they see themselves looking very slim and attractive, the way they'd like to see themselves, seeing themselves through rose-coloured glasses. The little cat looks in the mirror and sees something quite different back. If only, if only. And sometimes life can jolt us from one way of seeing things, one way of thinking about ourselves, to another, a moment of metanoia. In 1888, the man whose photograph you see there happened to pick up a newspaper. The newspaper was written in French. But in the newspaper, he read his own obituary. Now, he was very much alive. The newspaper had, in fact, made a mistake. It was his brother who had died, not he. But he was startled to see how the newspaper wrote about himself. The headline was, The Merchant of Death is Dead. And it went on to talk about him as a person who became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before. He was, in fact, the inventor of dynamite. And his name? Alfred Nobel. Now, isn't it interesting? We talk now about the Nobel Peace Prize. And what was it that jolted 
Alfred Nobel from being a merchant of death to someone with whom we associate the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, it was that headline, reading his own obituary, suddenly jolted him into looking at life differently. Seeing what was important beforehand is no longer important now. The movie The Devil Wears Prada is a story about a young woman, Andrea Sachs, known as Andy. She's an aspiring journalist, fresh out of university, and she ends up with the magazine job a million girls would kill for. She's going to be the junior personal assistant to the rather imperious editor-in-chief of a magazine called Runway. The editor-in-chief is Miranda Priestley, the role played by Meryl Streep. But Miranda dominates the fashion world from her perch atop Runway magazine. In the world of fashion, hers is the only opinion that really matters. Now, Andy doesn't really want a job as a personal assistant. She wants to be a journalist. But she understands that if she puts up with Miranda's rather eccentric and demeaning requests, because if she lasts a year in the position, she's told, she'll get her pick of other jobs, perhaps even the journalistic position she really wants. But it has to be said that the Andy we first meet is not the kind of girl taken up with the world of fashion typified by Runway magazine. And so we see this rather interesting scene in which Miranda gives Andrea the once over. And notice, by the way, she doesn't even call her by her correct name. And Emily? Yes. That's all. In the temple of fashion, Andrea has virtually committed a sacrilege, dressed as she is. Well, for any of us, it's very hard to work in an environment and feel as though you're not fitting in. And in some ways, Andy is on the outer. However, Nigel, the art director, takes her under his wing. I don't know what you expect me to do. There's nothing in this whole closet that'll fit a size six, I can guarantee you. These are all sample sizes, two and four. All right, we'll adjourn this for you, and... A poncho. You'll take what I give you and you'll like it. We're doing this Dolce for you. Hmm. And shoes, Jimmy Choo. Mm. Nola Vlamic. Wow. Nancy Gonzalez, love that. <laughs> okay, this is a Rodriguez. This we love. Mm -hmm. uh, it might fit. It might. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Chanel, you're in desperate need of Chanel. Darling, shall we? We have to get to the beauty department, and God knows how long that's going to take. Mm -hmm. So here we find perhaps the first step in a slow and gradual transformation in Andy's life. Not just in the way she appears, but also the kind of person she's going to become. And so the transformed Andy starts to raise some eyebrows. I just knew from the moment I saw her, she was going to be a complete and utter disaster. Miranda Priestley's office? No, actually, she's not available, but I'll leave word. Okay, thanks, bye. <clears throat> Are you wearing the, sh the Chanel boots? Yeah, I am. 
you look good. So, Andy is now slowly beginning to fit in. She's becoming part of the runway scene. Well, the transformation looks evident. Notice the look of approval Andy now receives from Miranda. But at what price does this approval come? Well, one of her girlfriends, someone who's known her for years, says, for the last 16 years I've known everything about that Andy, but this person, this Glamazon, I don't get her. It's not just an external change in fashion, but it's a slow and gradual change of lifestyle. And so there's a scene when she meets up with her boyfriend, Nate, and he hears from someone else that Andy is to go across to Paris to accompany Miranda, something he, of course, would have much rather have heard from her. But, well, I just don't really have much time to talk now because the runway world seems to take up all of her time and emotional energy. And so there's this confrontation between Nate and Andy. You used to say this was just a job. You used to make fun of the runway girls. What happened? Now, now you've become one of them. That's absurd. Hey, that's okay. That's fine. Just own up to it. And then we can stop pretending like we have anything in common anymore. You don't mean that. <laughs> no, I do. Well, maybe this trip is coming at a good time. Maybe we should take a break. Nate? I'm sorry. Just one second. You know, in case you were wondering, the person whose calls you always take, that's the relationship you're in. I hope you two are very happy together. Andy does accompany Miranda to Paris, but it's there that she has to make a decision. It becomes for her, in fact, a moment of metanoia, of stepping back and seeing the person she has become and realising that that is not the person she wants to be. She wants to see herself in quite a different way. She wants to be a different kind of person to the woman she now has become. And so this scene in Paris...
Andy walks away with a great sense of relief and freedom. She now is becoming the kind of person she truly wants to be. And so this holy season of Lent is a time when we are called to metanoia, to step back from our lives, to look at ourselves, and perhaps to see that we have become a person that we don't really want to be. Metanoia is a summons to start thinking differently about who and what is truly important to us. To think differently about ourselves and about what is important. To see our thing, ourselves, in a different way. Repent and believe the good news.